So I did this thing in that uh, case. This is part two. I did this thing in that case, the Texas case, where I uh, did the only thing that was not 100% entirely uh, authentic and in accordance with what I understood to be the formal rules of procedure. See, I had read an issue of the uh, Texas Bar Journal, and they talked about who the president of the Texas Bar Association was at the time, when the State Bar of Texas had been uh, recently elected. And his number and his name is not in the registry or the database for lawyers that are registered with the State Bar of Texas. What sense does it make that the president of the board of directors, the president of the State Bar of Texas, would not even have a bar number listed in the official website? You don't think somebody was setting up something for propagandistic purposes, do you? I mean, I only encountered this information in a public law library that was on the ground floor of the building where the county attorney had his office on the top floor. Nah, 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 nah. I must have made a mistake. So I decided to check with the court. And uh, that was part of the mischaracterization. And we're dealing with that now. But when I went and, you know, tried to put that into the uh, district court system, tried to appeal it a little later into the district court system, part of what I had mentioned is uh, there's various kinds of techniques. And I was questioning, you know, I, I'm trying to represent myself pro se, but, you know, I don't have the kind of insurance a lawyer does. And because I don't have the kind of insurance a lawyer does, it's kind of hard to say that my certifications can actually, uh, you know, uh, compete at or perform at the level that an official lawyer does. And you won't give me a lawyer, but I don't have the kind of insurance they do. So why are you using my cases and stuff connected to my filing efforts for all this other stuff that you really should be insured on, right? Well, I got a response from the court from that magistrate judge. And then... After I got, uh, I, I filed an appeal, and then the judge himself backed her up, said, oh, I support her filing, her, fi her findings. But what I didn't know is that there was another case that had come up on the radar, so to speak. Now, see, I had encountered this case before I even filed this, right? I had found this case out another way. But this is the interesting thing about this case, is that... This case is an, another what I understand to be derivative litigation effort involving somebody who this time shares the same last name as, you see that? <gasps> no way. This case is from 2014. And it lists the Federal Housing Administration insured mortgagers alleging kickbacks involving the petitioner and a series of mortgagers and insurance companies concerning somebody's personal private home complaint. Now, the thing is, you know, when you get this kind of uh, resonance and this kind of magnetism, and you're thinking to yourself, what's going on? See, what happened is I understand this in a sense of a certain kind of uh, pipeline management. If it's done legitimately and it's certified and things are disclosed and you have the appropriate contracts, now that I got the forms right, you know, I know what it's supposed to look like. Then you might be saying that you're talking about upstream versus midstream versus downstream. But if you don't disclose and you commit fraud, and then you divert or defer somebody and launder stuff through their efforts so that later you can get something hooked up, delivered. That's called a kickback. The problem is this case has a very, very nice sort of uh, modality associated with it. But that did not come up in the confirmation of Justice Gorsuch. It came up in the confirmation of Justice Kavanaugh. So the question is, who's been actually getting the results of my litigious efforts? Who's actually being availed of the benefits of the kind of arguments I'm making in my legal filings? Stay tuned. <laughs>